Greetings. Father Mark signing on, continuing the series on the Catholic Church and the history of the United States. Last time we got up to 1836, uh, which was the uh, when uh, what, what later became the state of Texas seceded from uh, Mexico and declared its independence and uh, would stay in that condition um, for another decade and and so we'll get to in, in the next decade we'll get to um, how and when it became a state so uh, in this session our objective will be to complete the decade of the 1830s so um, after 1836 or actually starting in that year in 1836 and then in the following year uh, we encounter the first two states well, the first two territories admitted to the Union as states after the Missouri Compromise. So we covered that earlier in the course in 1820, uh, in which uh, Maine and Missouri were admitted as states. Missouri as a slave state, Maine as a free state. So in 1836, and then early in the following year, 37, are the first two admitted after that. This was in order uh, State 25, the state of Arkansas, admitted on June 15th, 1836, and State 26, the state of Michigan, admitted in the early the next year, January 26th, 1837. Arkansas admitted as a slave state and Michigan admitted as a free state to maintain that balance, uh, an equal number of slave and free states, which was, that was the Missouri Compromise of 1820. So uh, Arkansas, state number 25, uh, the word comes from, uh, it's an, an Ogopaw word. Uh, the Ogopaw were an uh, indigenous uh, tribe, a Native American, as we'd say today. Uh, Ogopaw word meaning uh, south wind. Uh, now, Arkansas is the 29th uh, of the, uh, in terms of size, is the 29th largest state, uh, comprised of 53,100 square miles, and that is slightly larger than the current borders of the nation of Greece. Uh, Greece is now comprised of 50,900 square miles. So by way of background, um, now as Arkansas and Michigan, we visited Michigan several times before, so we won't spend too much time in Michigan, uh, but this is our first visit to Arkansas. Uh, so by way of background, uh, hominids first appeared in the area now called Arkansas around 11,700 B.C. during the Pleistocene Ice Age, having crossed from East Asia, uh, using the then exposed land bridge beneath what is now the Bering Strait. After the glaciers began melting, uh, rivers formed, and forests appeared around 9,500 B.C. Exemplar burial mounds from this period can be visited today at the Parkin Archaeological State Park, which is in the, the northeast part of the state uh, of Arkansas. In 1541, the first recorded visit by Europeans was led by Spanish explorer Hernando de Soto. It was looking for gold. And he's the one who named the Mississippi River, uh, which is now the eastern border uh, of most of Arkansas. He named it the, the River of the Holy Spirit. I think we covered that earlier during the Spanish colonial period. The French called it the River of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, DeSoto uh, fell ill and died uh, near present-day MacArthur, Arkansas. That's in the southeast part of the state. He died in May of 1542. His men weighted his corpse with uh, sand and, and then sunk it into the Mississippi River. French exploration of the area occurred in 1673 during the expedition, which we've also covered, earlier in the course of the, uh, the French Jesuit, Jacques Marquette, 
and the uh, the Canadian French uh, layman who uh, who joined him, Louis Joliet. Eight years later, in 1681, another French expedition, led by René Robert, the Sieur de la, the Sieur de la Salle, or Robert de la Salle, uh, whom we've already met, uh, passed through the uh, through the area of Arkansas. He was just going down the river looking for the mouth of the river, the Mississippi River, uh, which they reached, meaning that so they in Louisiana, in April of 1682. At, at which point he claimed, on April 9th, <laughs> claimed all all the land drained by the Mississippi and all of its tributaries uh, for France, which made Arkansas part of the Louisiana Territory. <clears throat> One member of the La Salle expedition was uh, uh, Sardinian, actually, but Sardinia at that point was part of uh, part of France. His name was Henri or Henry de Tonti, T O N T I. Uh, he, uh, de Tonti, established the uh, a place, a settlement called the Arkansas Post in 1686, upriver from the convergence of the Arkansas River and the Mississippi River. Uh, on today, currently, that is um, it's southeast of uh, Gillette, Arkansas which is in the southeast part of the state. Arkansas Point was the, excuse me, Arkansas Post, uh, Arkansas Post, was the first European settlement in the lower Mississippi River Valley uh, in present-day Arkansas. It was essentially a fortified trading station uh, where the, the French, the Carrere du Bois, and other French settlers uh, traded with the, the Ogopaw tribe. Arkansas was part of the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, at which point Arkansas Point was the first capital uh, of the territory. And later, as we'll see in a minute, uh, that capital was relocated to Little Rock in 1821. But before that happened, uh, after the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, the president, the U.S. president who accomplished that was Thomas Jefferson. He commissioned and persuaded Congress to pay for four expeditions of exploration to map the newly acquired territory, to establish, survey, usable travel routes for settlement, and to collect scientific information regarding natural resources. The most famous of the four is the one you would have you know, all heard in uh, earlier history courses, American history courses, that's the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, which worked from uh, 1803 to 1806, led by uh, Meriwether uh, Lewis and uh, William Clark. Uh, the, and they, they mustered at St. Louis, Missouri, on the Mississippi River, and, and pointed west, uh, going to the Pacific, uh, and they, which they reached at the Columbia River uh, near present-day Astoria, Oregon. For Arkansas history, the second of the four Jeffersonian expeditions was more important. As Lewis and Clark never, never went to Arkansas, they went the other way. But the second one was the Dunbar-Hunter expedition of 1804. Named for uh, two Scott, uh, Scottish immigrants, uh, you know, immigrants from Scotland. Uh, one, uh, William Dunbar, who uh, became a merchant, uh, settled in Mississippi, was a plantation owner, uh, uh, a naturalist, as they would have said then, someone, an amateur interested in history. Uh, he was also a member uh, and a published author for the American Philosophical Society, which is how he came to the attention of, of Jefferson. Uh, the other guy, George Hunter, also from Scotland, but he settled in Philadelphia, where he earned a reputation as a chemist as well as a naturalist. On March 13, 1804, President Jefferson commissioned this Dunbar-Hunter expedition to explore the lower uh, Louisiana Purchase, which is you know, lower in the, in the sense of elevation, so the uh, uh, southern, uh, southern Louisiana Purchase, although... We'll see. I mean, Arkansas is not all low. Uh, part of it is, but 
Uh, it also contains mountains. So this expedition departed uh, on, um, uh, also from St. Louis on October 16th, 1804, with a party of 15, for what turned out to be only a three-month exploration of the Red River, the Black River, and the Washita River. The Washita and the Black River, the same river. It just, it just, it changes names. Um, uh, they recorded the first chemical analysis of Hot Springs, Arkansas, which is uh, southwest of the center point of the state, and uh, that also is now a, a national park. Hot Springs a National Park. The third of Jefferson's expeditions included both Arkansas and Louisiana. This was the Red River Expedition of 1806. The Red River was once a tributary of the Mississippi River, but, you know, the river courses, they, they move over time. So now the Red River is 1,300 miles long. It is a tributary of the Atchafalaya River. And the Atchafalaya is a distributary, flows out of the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico. But so the Red River enters the Atchafalaya and then goes to the Gulf of Mexico. The south bank of the Red River formed part of the U.S.-Mexico border uh, until after the Mexican-American War, which we're going to cover in a future session. Um, that war lasted from 1846 to 1848. So until, that, until the conclusion of that war, the South, the, the Red River was the border between uh, the Louisiana Purchase, which from 1803 was part of the United States, and and the Spanish, well, Spanish Mexico, which they referred to as New Spain, was the you know the province of New Spain. Uh, currently, the uh, the Red River has two sources uh, that both arise in the Texas Panhandle, flow east, uh, where it serves as uh, as part uh, as the border between Texas and Oklahoma, and uh, then a short portion of the border between Texas and Arkansas, then enters Arkansas, turning south near Fulton, and then enters Louisiana, uh, where we've encountered it already when we covered uh, the Nacogdoches settlements. And uh, in Louisiana, further south, it, inter it intersects the Atchafalaya. The soldiers of the 1806 expedition were led by a captain, Army Captain Richard, Richard Sparks. The scientists were, uh, one was an astronomer who, who was also a surveyor named Thomas Freeman, uh, and uh, the other, the, the botanist and ethnographer, was actually a medical student from Pennsylvania named Peter Custis, C-U-S-T-I-S. The 24-member Red River Expedition departed uh, on April 19, 1806, from Fort Adams, which was near Natchez, Mississippi, and turned uh, into the, uh, then they, they turned to go find the Red River. When they got the river, they followed it upstream west. They entered Texas, which was then, uh, in 1806, was still a, a part of, of Spain. Therefore, on July 28, 1806, they were intercepted by Spanish troops uh, only 615 miles into their journey near present New Boston, Texas. Uh, that's seven miles south of the current Arkansas-Texas border. And the Spanish troops are like, you know, dude, what, you know, this is, this is an armed expedition. You know, it's like, okay, did you did you arrange the, arrange this with the king, or you know, the, <clears throat> which of course they had not. Uh, so that that this encounter ended, uh, you know, a, a premature ending to the Red River expedition, which led to the fourth of the Jeffersonian explorer exploration missions, the Pike expedition, eighteen oh six into eighteen oh seven led and named for, named for the leader who was a lieutenant, an army lieutenant uh, who was promoted to captain during the expedition, named Zebulon Pike, P-I-K-E, Jr. 
Zebulon Pike Jr. Uh, this expedition explored the western Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains. Uh, well, not all of them, of course, that, that, you know, that, uh, but the, the portion of the Rocky Mountains that are in the present-day state of Colorado. Among the accomplishments of this expedition, uh, they documented, uh, the surveyed and documented, the highest peak of the southern front range of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, this was the 14,000. 115 foot granite and feldspar prominence that is now designated as Pikes Peak, 12 miles west of present day Colorado Springs, Colorado. The enthusiastic Captain Pike committed the same breach as, his, as the previous expedition by wandering into Spanish territory. On February 26, 1807, they were captured near present-day Alamosa in southern Colorado, which ended that expedition. Although this time the, the Spanish were mad, they actually arrested these guys and, and uh, brought them back to Mexico. And then, you know, made, you know, you, it made, you know, made a diplomatic issue out of it. So uh, some of these guys ended up spending years in, in prison in Mexico before they were repatriated. And so, you know, that... Uh, well, Jefferson wasn't president anymore by that point, but uh, uh, so there were no more expeditions like this uh, until after the Mexican-American War. So let me see. Let's try this. Um, how much to? I mean, since this is the. So uh, this this is the United States. I, I I don't want to insult anyone, you know. But I, I mean, obviously, I think you. Well, uh, so just to refresh, you know, refresh our memories here. Um, this is see. So uh, here we have Louisiana, see, down here. And here's the Mississippi, you know, which, which goes down to the, the toe, the toe of Louisiana. You follow it up. And then uh, here's Arkansas. You see the eastern border of Arkansas is, is the Mississippi River. And then uh, the other state that was admitted with Arkansas is Michigan up here which is uh, uh, between the two of the, the Great Lakes, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But the Louisiana Territory originally went all the way from the Gulf to the Great Lakes, as we covered uh, before. And here, while I have this out, here's Little Rock, which is uh, I'm going to talk about in a minute, it's the capital of Arkansas. Now, uh, I think I have another one that you can see the topography better. Of course, it's going to be the last one. Yeah, here. <clears throat> All right, now this, you, you, you only see Louisiana here at the bottom, the border. Uh, but here you see uh, Arkansas. So notice the topographical differences. You have... Uh, the, the mountains up here, the Ozarks, those are the highlands. But then when you it descends down to when you get to the Mississippi, it's uh, it's plains. You know, it's uh, flat alluvial plains. So this is where the plantations were. But up here in the in the mountains, um, it was a com completely different economy and culture, more hunting and trapping, and fishing. Whereas whereas down here became more agricultural. <clears throat> Okay, um, so uh, that the expedition ended in 1807, the, the Pike Expedition. Twelve years later, 
on March 2nd, 1819, a portion of the Louisiana Purchase applied to Congress to be admitted to the Union as the state of Missouri, in which slavery would be, would be legal. Slavery would, would exist. Now, we covered this earlier, so I won't repeat all the details. Just recall that it nearly triggered the Civil War, which was only temporarily averted by the Missouri Compromise of 1820. The significance for Arkansas is that after, uh, when Missouri was entered, was accepted into the Union in 1820, the southern border of Missouri became the, the northern border of Arkansas, with the Arkansas Territory. And that is the uh, latitude 36 degrees, 30 minutes north. Which it still is. <clears throat> Eleven years later, in 1831, some elements in the Arkansas Territory began organizing to draft a constitution, which was a requirement, a preliminary requirement to apply for statehood. A territory had to have at least uh, 60,000 members, 60,000 people uh, resident, and then they had to write a constitution and then submit it, you know, when they applied, uh, submit it to Congress to apply for statehood. Now, as I said earlier, this was the first such first time such an application was made after Missouri and Maine were admitted as part of the Compromise of 1820. In order to uh, maintain the balance of slave states and free states, and uh, following the geographical stipulation of the Missouri Compromise, Michigan, it was arranged that Michigan in the north would be admitted to the Union as a state in which slavery would not exist, while Arkansas would be admitted as a state in which slavery did exist. President Andrew Jackson signed the bill, creating the state of Arkansas as the 25th state of the Union on June 15, 1836. In terms of church history, a prelate whom we've already met visited Arkansas in 1820 the second bishop of Louisiana and the two Floridas. But remember, Arkansas was part of that diocese because Louisiana at the time went all the way from the Gulf to the Great Lakes. And this was the most Reverend Louis Guillaume de Bourg, D-U-B-O-U-R-G. Vincentian priest served the area that is now Arkansas, uh, as well as secular priests who were trained at their seminary, St. Mary at the Barrens in Missouri established by DeBorg two years earlier. Fourteen years later, Congress passed the, now I know this doesn't sound right, so but it passed a law called the Indian Non-Intercourse Act. All right, now, I know you think I'm making this, no, no, I'm not making this up. This currently exists. This is codified in the U.S. Code, uh, 25 U.S. Code, uh, Section 177. In part, uh, this this established Indian territory, as as it as it was called, uh, sort of, kind of. It it's where the current state of Oklahoma exists, uh, which which at this which at this point was not a state, but um, what later became the state was Indian territory. Though I say that with hesitation because the situation with the Indian reservations, as they were called, was and remains far more complicated than that. So the term Indian reservation has a specific legal meaning, referring to territory managed by the federal government, not the state governments, the federal government, um, uh, specifically the U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs. So that like regardless of what state the reservation is in physically, uh, the, the, those on the reservation are not bound by that state's law. Instead, they're, they're, they're bound by federal law. Now, of course, there are some you know, federal laws where the state laws are the same. Uh, so this is, this is how, you know, the, in states where gambling, for example, is illegal, or during Prohibition, where, where, where alcohol was illegal. Uh, and the states, 
gambling could take place on those reservations. Uh, okay, so currently, uh, this bureau uh, recognizes 574 tribes, uh, na- you know, Native American tribes or indigenous, you know, descendants of the indigenous people. And allocate, it recognizes allocation of 326 reservations. So 574 tribes, 326 reservations, territorial reservations. So the, the, the reservations total 87,000 square miles. Now that's about the size of the state of Idaho, but... The, these 87,000 square miles are not contiguous. Like, you know, they're, all, they're in multiple states. Now, most of them are west of the Mississippi. Not all, but most of them are. Uh, but it's not contiguous. Now, why is there a difference? Why doesn't each tribe have a, re- have a reservation? Well, there's some tribes that share reservation. Like one reservation will have multiple tribes on it because the tribes are very small. While other tribes have no reservations at all. Currently, uh, at least last time I looked this up, uh, which was the last census, but that's the 2010 census. So the 2020 census, last time I looked up, it wasn't fully processed down to this level. So, yeah. But as of that previous time, uh, there are there 2.5 million Native Americans, meaning descendants of the indigenous people, live within the current borders of the United States. So that includes Alaska, you know, which is part of the United States, Alaska and Hawaii, which are part of the United States, but non-contiguous. And Alaska does have many, many of the, you know, there. Now, of those two and a half million, one million live on reservations. Okay. Now, uh, one of the secular priests trained by the Vincentians for service in Arkansas was a father, Richard Bowl, B-O-L-E. He established St. Mary's Mission Church five miles from the present Pine Bluff, Arkansas. In 1838, he persuaded five sisters of Loretto to relocate there. You know, there they had been in Missouri, then well, Italy, then Missouri, then you go to, and there uh, at St. Mary's Mission, Pine Bluff, they established the first Catholic school within the borders of, of what is now Arkansas. Five years later, on November 28, 1843, the state of Arkansas, along with the Indian Territory that is now the state of Oklahoma, were formed ecclesially into the Diocese of Little Rock. Little Rock is the name of a rock formation along the Arkansas River near the geographical center of the current state. I think I showed you the map where Little Rock is. Um, And then uh, in 1821, the capital of Arkansas was, was moved from Arkansas Post to Little Rock, and it's still the capital today. The first mass in Little Rock, the settlement of Little Rock, was offered nine years later in 1830 by a secular priest, Irish immigrant, uh, Father Peter Donnelly, serving the Diocese of St. Louis, Missouri, to the north. He used a room over uh, a store, over a a, a grocery store, uh, Duggan's, Duggan's Grocery Store, which is at the corner, well, was at the corner of 2nd and Main Street. This small Catholic congregation then purchased a building to use as a church uh, on East Markham near 3rd Street. Then the following year, November 7th, 1831, the city of Little Rock was incorporated on the southern bank of the Arkansas River. The founding bishop of Little Rock was another Irish immigrant priest, the Most Reverend Andrew Byrne. Now that's B Y R N E, the Irish spelling. 
Andrew Byrne was born in County Meath, Ireland, the son of Robert and Marjorie, baptized Andrew because he was uh, born on November 30th on the Feast of St. Andrew. It was his misfortune to be born at a time in Ireland at a time when the island was under the Anglo-Protestant occupation of Great Britain meaning he had, because of the anti-popery laws that we covered earlier in the course, he had to leave in order to practice his faith freely and to become a priest. At that point, his life intersects with the story of another prelate we've already met, Bishop John England, another Irish immigrant who served as the founding bishop of the Diocese of Charleston. Bishop England ordained Byrne a priest in Charleston, on November 11, 1827. Father Byrne served as pastor of St. Mary's Parish in Charleston and in 1833 attended the Second Council of Baltimore, which we also covered, as a peritus for Bishop England. Three years later, in 1836, Father Byrne relocated to New York City, where he served at St. Patrick's and at St. James. Three years later, in 1839, the institutional antecedent of what eventually became St. Andrew's Cathedral in Little Rock was established. Father Bowl, whom we've already met, constructed a church where the arcade building was located, and uh, subsequently this was referred to as the Old French Church. As Arkansas was not yet a diocese, this church was consecrated in 1841 by Bishop Matthias Loris of the Diocese of Dubuque, Iowa, whom we met earlier and we're going to meet again. He, he was a, a French immigrant priest. Two years later, the Diocese of Little Rock was established by Pope Gregory the Sixteenth on November 28, 1843, with Father Byrne as the well, Bishop Byrne as the founder. He was consecrated in St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, as he was serving in that diocese at the time, on May 10th, 1844. In the same ceremony, two other guys were also consecrated. One, John McCloskey, he was consecrated as coadjutor, Bishop of New York, and later he would become uh, uh, Archbishop of New York, and the first American Cardinal, John McCloskey. Uh, and also ordained a bishop in the same ceremony was Father then ordained Bishop William Quarter, Quarter as in the you know quarter quarter, you know the the coin. Uh, uh, later he became Bishop of uh, no he was ordained in this ceremony as Bishop of Chicago, Illinois. In 1850, uh, Bishop Byrne recruited 13 Sisters of Mercy to establish St. Mary's Academy in the city of Little Rock. And the following year, 1851, they established St. Anne's Academy at Fort Smith. Uh, these, these are girls' academy, they're girls' schools. Three years later, in 1854, Bishop Byrne witnessed an outbreak of anti-Catholicism that he had hoped he had escaped when fleeing his occupied homeland. The rabid... Catholic hating know nothings. We'll get more into detail with them in due course. Uh, they burned down uh, a church and school of the Sisters of Mercy at Helena, Arkansas, which is on the Mississippi River side, uh, in the, like the central east border of the state. Bishop Byrne died on June 10th, 1862, during the Civil War. So the diocese remained sede vacante for five years, no bishop. Under his leadership, the diocese had grown from four to 13 churches, plus 30 mission stations, plus 12 schools, served by nine priests having to ride the circuit, uh, as well as the Sisters of Mercy teaching girls and the Christian Brothers teaching boys. On February 3rd, 1867, the Most Reverend Edward Fitzgerald, another Irish immigrant, 
so at the time he was serving as a pastor of St. Patrick's Church in Columbus, Ohio, became the second bishop of Little Rock. He completed the current Cathedral of St. Andrews on the corner of South Louisiana Street and West 7th Street in downtown Little Rock. He laid the cornerstone 1878 and dedicated the church in 1881. It was and it remains a very impressive Gothic revival structure, 140 feet long, 86 feet wide, placed on the National Register of Historic Places, quite properly, in 1986. And we'll meet him again as he attended the First Vatican Council and became the only American to vote against the doctrine of papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council, and one of only two bishops to do so, but we'll get to that later in the course. Uh, State number 26, the state of Michigan, admitted to the Union January 26th, 1837. So we visited Michigan several times previously. So here we'll just summarize a few relevant details regarding statehood. The Michigan Territory of the United States came into existence on June 30th, 1805. Twenty years later, the Erie Canal opened in 1825, allowing settlers from New England and New York to relocate and reach Michigan by water, by going through Albany and Buffalo. So that the population in Michigan then starts to to grow. Nine years later, in 1834, all of the lands acquired in the Louisiana Purchase east of the Missouri River that were as yet unallocated became Michigan territory, as it was called. Essentially, that it corresponds to what is now the states of Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, and a large portion of the two Dakotas. Michigan was accepted as state number 26, as I said, in 1837. Initially, Detroit was the territorial capital. On July 3rd, 1836, in preparation for Michigan being admitted, some of the territory was carved out um, to create the Wisconsin Territory. And that consisted of the present-day states of Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Iowa, and the eastern portion of the Dakotas. Uh, When Michigan became a state, uh, it included the Upper Peninsula. Uh, The western border of the Upper Peninsula was marked at the Montreal River on the Lake Superior shoreline and the uh, Menominee River on the coast of Lake Michigan. Detroit remained the capital of the state until 1847 when Lansing, Michigan, became uh, became the capital. The name Michigan is derived from an Ojibwe word, uh, Michigami, meaning large water. Currently, Michigan is the 11th largest state of the Union by territory, measuring 96,700 square miles. Uh, By comparison, the United Kingdom is 93,600 miles. Michigan is the only state comprised of two peninsula. The Upper Peninsula, conventionally referred to as the UP, is separated from the Lower Peninsula by the Straits of Mackinac, which is a five-mile-long channel that connects Lake Huron to Lake Michigan. Uh, Michigan is bordered by four of the five Great Lakes, plus Lake St. Clair, hence, you know, the name, Large Water. Uh, Let's see. So, um, 
you see uh, Michigan between the lakes. And so you have the, the two peninsula, the upper, the upper peninsula, the UP, and the lower peninsula connected by the strait. You see that goes between the two lakes, two great lakes. So up there. And uh, then we talk about, we'll get to Wisconsin later, which is going to be one of the triggers for uh, the Americanism uh, dispute in the later 19th century. Uh, in terms of church history, we visited Michigan already. Uh, it was under the ecclesiastical jurisdiction of the Diocese of Quebec uh, when all that was uh, when Canada was a French colony <clears throat> from 1701 uh, until uh, the, the French lost Canada to the British, uh, and then after the American Revolution. That since it's right up with the border of Canada, uh, the British did not want to give up. Uh, Detroit, you know, they didn't want to give all of it up, so it became a point of contention. And actually, you know, wars were fought over this, and and because the British had suborned some of the indigenous tribes to fight against the United States, um, but that and that would take us too far afield. Uh, in terms of uh, church history, at the time, uh, uh, after uh, from 1796, the uh, the diocese of Baltimore encompass the whole uh, of the United States. Well, from 17, except uh, in 1793, the Diocese of Louisiana and the two Floridas was created. But anyway, um, and then when the, when, the, uh, when the Diocese of Baltimore was subdivided in 1808, <clears throat> uh, the, the, this, this Michigan fell to the Diocese of Bardstown, Kentucky. And then later, when when the Diocese of Bardstown was was carved up, the Diocese of Cincinnati, Ohio, was created in 1821. And uh, Michigan, including Detroit, uh, were assigned to the Diocese of Cincinnati. The Diocese of Detroit was established on March 8, 1833, by Pope Gregory XVI. Frederick Reze was the founding bishop, whom we've already met. At the time, the Diocese of Detroit covered Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, both Dakotas, up to the Missouri River. A decade later, 1843, all territory of the diocese not incorporated into the state of Michigan was transferred to the Diocese of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. On July 29, 1853, Pope Pius IX formed the Vicariate Apostolic of Upper Michigan with responsibility for the Upper Peninsula. The territory of the diocese would be further reduced uh, to its current size by the organization as was carved up into the Diocese of Grand Rapids, Michigan in 1882, the Diocese of Lansing, 1937, Saginaw, 1938, and uh, in the midst of all those changes, Detroit was elevated to an archdiocese on May 22nd, 1937. Okay, so that's uh, those two states. Um, now, uh, uh, 1836 was an election year. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the victor was Martin Van Buren, became president number eight, sworn in at the time. You remember, uh, at the time, the uh, uh, swearing in was in March. So he was sworn in on March 4th, 1837, was president until March 4th, 1841. Martin Van Buren, uh, born 1782, died 1862 was uh, of Dutch ancestry, but he was born in New York, in Kinderhook, New York. He was the son of a farmer and a tavern keeper. Uh, thus, he was a working class rather than a plantation-owning aristocrat like his predecessor, 
and political patron, Andrew Jackson. Now, I should say for those, you know, fans of a certain kind of, of history, uh, there is a persistent rumor that Martin Van Buren was actually the illegitimate son of Aaron Burr. I'll just leave that out there. But, you know, there are those who compared the two, their height, and you know, the general physiognomy. And, and they say, well, where was he? And where, you know, at the time when he would have, when Martin would have had to be conceived, and it turns out that works. And Anyway, just throw that out there. Uh, and anyway, so he studied law. Van Buren did. Passed the bar, 1803, entered state politics, became a state senator, 1813, Attorney General, 1816, a U.S. Senator, 1821. He was a Jacksonian Democrat, an admirer of, of, of Jackson, Andrew Jackson, whose campaign he ardently supported and was rewarded, as Jackson believed in the spoils system. So President Jackson appointed Martin Van Buren as Secretary of State. And Van Buren was a consistent, loyal champion of all Jackson's causes, including pro-slavery. But Jackson was a slave owner, uh, but Van Buren and his family, not, I mean, they never owned slaves. They were working class uh, poor people, and there were Northerners. But anyway, Van Buren continued to support Jackson, even when Jackson's cabinet fell apart over the nullification crisis. That was the tariff issue. Uh, that we covered uh, previously. I think we did. Yeah, it was 1832. And uh, recall Jackson's own vice president, John Calhoun of South Carolina, actually resigned as vice president in opposition to the tariff. You know, I, I, don't, I don't remember. I don't. Um, for his loyalty, Jackson chose Van Buren to replace Calhoun as vice president. And from that position, he successfully ran for the Democratic nomination after Jackson completed his second term and became the eighth president. Van Buren inherited an economic collapse precipitated by Jackson's economic policies, which we already covered. So Van Buren served only one term. You know, he, he gave, you know, whoever's in office gets blamed whenever the economy crashes. In his defeat, he assured the rise of the new Whig Party, W-H-I-G. Before we continue with that, before we get to that, uh, uh, just staying in the 1830s, uh, so there was a development occurred in the late 1830s that would affect the Catholic Church in the United States for decades. It would affect the whole country still to this day, but specifically the Catholic Church and, and uh, attacks against the Catholic Church into the 20th century, including a Supreme Court case in the 20th century. This is the public education movement, or what was called then the common school movement, or the free school movement, or public schools, you know. All right, by way of background, oh, I should say, at this point, if, if if I were teaching this, you know, if I were teaching civics, you know, to early high school or middle school kids, at this point, I would, uh, let's see, I would hold up a $10 bill, and then I, I'd, I would, of course, have assigned them the Constitution as one of their books, and then I would say, okay, this, this $10 bill, goes to the first person that can find in the Constitution schools. Find schools in the Constitution. All right. And then, oh, come on, I want the $10 so that it'll flip through that. You know. And then eventually, of course, you know, then, then the gag is that it's not in there. It's not in there. So, um, which raises the question. I mean, but it also, so it's not in there uh, at, listed as a responsibility of government. But it is also not excluded. You know, that does not say the government cannot engage in public education. 
but nor is it one of the earlier in the course we talked about the 18 enumerated powers and 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 public education is not one of them yet yet it's also not excluded it's not prohibited so same with political parties. I think I, I did that joke earlier with the political parties. You know, okay, you know, the first one to find political parties in the Constitution gets the, you know, gets the, the bill. And of course, there are no, there are no political parties in the Constitution either. But neither are they outlawed. Neither are they prohibited. And in that case, with the parties, the Constitution does allow the right of free association. And so that means political parties can exist. You know, so that's one of those. You know, a strict construction of the Constitution is okay. The public schools are not in there, therefore it's not a responsibility of government. But since they're also not specifically prohibited in the Constitution, they're those who have a different view. And that's and so now we're going to meet the guy who turned that different view philosophically into policy and into an institutional construct that is still with us, the public schools. New England Unitarians, along with other Protestant allies pursuing humanitarian causes as part of the social gospel movement, turned their publicity machine into a direction that shaped the rest of American history to our own day. That is the public school movement. Advocates argued that individuals have a better chance at achieving prosperity if educated if they know how to read, write, and do basic arithmetic. And that the nation as a whole benefits from an educated citizenry. Then they assume, they asserted, you know, well, of course, no private enterprise could hope to accomplish universal education for everyone. So they reason the government must therefore provide this. Their first success came in the year 1837, when the first state board of education was created. Or I should say the first board of education in any state. And it was in the state of Massachusetts. The first person to hold the position of state secretary of education was a Protestant abolitionist social reformer named Horace Mann. Uh, That's with two N's, M-A-N-N. Lived from 1796 to 1859. Now, since every single one of these early social reformers were Protestant, and many of them were were ministers too, Protestant ministers, it was axiomatic in their mind that public education, public school education, would have to include moral instruction. And that moral instruction could only be built on the foundation of the King James Bible. That is how the public education movement came to become a weapon against the Catholic Church. All right, so who is this guy? Horace Mann. Um, he, uh, he, he was what we would call today a social activist. He was an advocate uh, not only for free public schools. Uh, he was also a temperance advocate, uh, abolitionist, you know, believed uh, you know, as well, I think one of his quotes was, uh, if, "If slavery is not wrong, then nothing's wrong." Advocated for public hospitals uh, and and asylums for the mentally ill, as well as advocated for women's rights. He was born into a Calvinist family, brought up in the Calvinist Church in Franklin, Massachusetts. Though as an adult, he felt repelled by Calvinist anthropology, the total depravity of man, and the image of a vengeful God. Uh, so he, in, in, as an adult, he moved to the Unitarian side of the Protestant spectrum. Uh, attended and graduated from Brown University in Rhode Island. Uh, then attended professional school, uh, uh, law school, at Litchfield, Connecticut. He uh, then became a practicing Unitarian. He joined the First Parish Unitarian Church of Dedham, Massachusetts, D-E-D-H-A-M, in 1823. And in this period of his life, his early professional life, he began networking with other Unitarians uh, and other social activists pursuing humanitarian causes. His public service work 
led to public notoriety, which led to election uh, to the Massachusetts legislature, representing Dedham, 1827. There, uh, he successfully, uh, let's see, five years, he stayed five years in the legislature. Uh, He succeeded in obtaining state financial support for a railroad between Boston and the Hudson River, providing jobs as well as infrastructure development. Now, state financial support, that the state's not paying for that. It's the, the citizens in the state are paying for that. You know, it, it's through tax theft. You know, that, that the, you know, the government, uh, you know, just stipulates that a certain portion of, of, of either taxing a process like a sales tax or, or taxing, you know, a property, uh, uh, you know, a sta- uh, uh, real estate. Um, as yet, they, they could not tax income because that was originally that was according as unconstitutional. But again, the Constitution has contains a process to amend itself. And so later, as we'll see in the 20th century, the Constitution was amended to permit the income tax. Uh, anyway, so uh, just using uh, using tax theft to fund public infrastructure development was not something that man pioneered. Uh, we've seen precedents for that in, in, with the railroad and with canals. So um, it was a legislative achievement because not everybody agreed you know, but he did manage to get it passed. But further and more significantly for our purposes is man obtained sufficient votes to pass a law stipulating public funding for a hospital, a residential hospital for the mentally ill in in Worcester, Massachusetts. Now, that that certainly is not a wrong endeavor. I mean, you know, that people people who are afflicted with you know with mental conditions that is that's a you know that that's a heavy cross to carry. But going back to the you know just the, the founding documents, the founding documents of the nation. Uh, again, if I you know, the ten dollar bill and then the Constitution, you know, find it find it in there. Find find government funded hospitals. Find hospitals in here, and of course they're not there. The founding documents do not mention social services of any kind as a function of government. But neither do the founding documents forbid the government from doing so. So then it becomes a philosophical question. Economic, of course, because it's funded through tax theft, but also philosophical. Like, is this, like, before you even decide, should you take some of my money for this, is this even a proper endeavor for government? Or should it be left to private entities or churches of whatever denomination? All right, so that's the philosophical question. Uh, so this victory by man, by Horace Mann and his allies, reflects an emerging consensus among the social gospel Protestants that humanitarian projects did belong within the, within the province of civil government. And the reverse corollary also appears in man's legislative activities from this period. In his success, uh, it, unsuccessful, he attempted, but did not succeed. But eventually, you know, it would happen long after his death. He attempted to have the government in Massachusetts outlaw alcohol and gambling in the state. So this reveals that the social gospel Protestant leaders also believed that civil government has a responsibility to suppress activities regarded by them as a vice. Just as with the with the previous example with by using, you know, tax money, take, taking money from the, you know, the citizens of the state to fund a residential home for the mentally ill, they, you know, that flows from a philosophy which believes that it is proper for the government to promote 
activities that these individuals believed were virtuous. But then the other side is they believe the government has a responsibility to suppress activities that they regard as a vice, all of which has to be funded. So, I mean, the government doesn't just exist as, as some kind of, you know, non, non-spatial, non-temporal abstraction. It, it's funded. And it's 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 funded through tax theft, you know. So that that, that that's why the this tax this fell. Remember, that's how the country started, was a tax revolt, you know, uh, against Great Britain. So these this philosophical issue of taxation is going to continue to come up. Now, of course, it it is it is an economic issue because it involves transfer of, of money. But but underneath that, it's a philosophical issue. You have to answer the philosophical question first. You know, it, 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 about the nature, what is the proper role of government before you can get to how much money should the government have to do this? Okay, now we reviewed similar legislation, similar, similar moral legislation, but previously, but remember that was in the colonial period, especially the English colonies. When, when, the, when a, a, a version of the Protestantism, the Protestant movement, the Anglican Church, enjoyed established status in England and its colonies, with the monarch being head of the church. So in that philosophical paradigm, it certainly was part, uh, the, the, the church was part of the government. So then it was part of the role of government to, to create and enforce stipulations of the moral law as understood by the Anglican version of Protestantism. But man's activities in Massachusetts serve as an important historical indicator dating to the 1830s. This, this, this philosophy that government should enforce Protestant morality, even though the government of the country was no longer a colony of England, it was an officially secular republic. And that is in writing. You know, that it is that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. Huh. Okay, so these philosophical, I mean, this, 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 this stuff, it matters, you know. Uh, it, it, this is part of, it's part of our, like, we wouldn't exist without that. The country wouldn't exist if this philosophical issue hadn't come up. All right. Uh uh, 1830, Horace Mann married the daughter of Asa Messer, who was a Unitarian minister and also president of Brown University, Mann's alma mater. Her name was Charlotte. She died prematurely two years later, after which Mann relocated to Boston, same state but different city. Uh, that expanded his contacts with other Unitarian activists. He attended the Federal Street Church of the Reverend William Ellery Channing, where he met and married Mary Peabody. She was the sister of Sophia Peabody, who was the wife of the famous American author Nathaniel Hawthorne. Uh, together, Horace, with his second wife Mary, had three sons. When Mann left Dedham and went to Boston, he left the jurisdiction of the legislative district of Dedham, where he, he was representing. So he had to give up his seat in the state legislature. In Boston, though, he continued his activity, so he was elected again, this time to the state Senate in 1835. And the next year, he became president of the state Senate of Massachusetts. And there he continued his strategy of pushing government funding and enforcement of Unitarian moral objectives, Protestant Unitarian moral objectives. So government funding, that means tax theft. That means taking money from the citizens. So among these objectives, these Protestant Unitarian moral objectives in the 1830s, was government funding for free, free schools, as they, you know, free, yeah, that's what I... So that, that's a propaganda device. Of course, nothing's free because, you know, that's just not how the universe works. But it means free, that's how they would sell it, is that you, as a parent, do not have to pay directly tuition, you know, for this for your kid to go to school here. But, of course, you are paying taxes. 
you know, so and so you are paying, so it's not free, but that's that's just part of the propaganda. That's how people are manipulated. Oh, it's free, therefore it's good. Uh, and he succeeded, man succeeded, because, uh, you know, people fell for that, that, oh, free, yeah, it's free. Um, succeeded in persuading the legislature to accomplish this by creating and funding the Massachusetts Board of Education with Mann himself as the founding secretary in 1837. So, now you've heard enough, you heard me, my view on this, but as, as we always try to let these people speak on their own terms when possible, and we do have writings from Mann, so he can speak on his own terms. So I will read you his words, and you can decide for yourself. This is from an annual report of Horace Mann as Secretary of the Massachusetts State Board of Education. Quote, A cardinal object which the government of Massachusetts and all the influential men in the state should propose to themselves is the physical well-being of all the people, the sufficiency, the comfort, the competence of every individual in regard to food, raiment, and shelter. And these necessities and conveniences of life should be obtained by every individual for himself or by each family for themselves rather than accepted from the hand of charity or extorted by poor laws. All right, so he's, uh, I'm interrupting. You see, it's very good because he's, he's anticipating, he knows the objection. He'd known it for years from when he first tried to do this in the legislature. So he knows the objectives. He knows the objections to this, is that the only way to fund this is by taking money from the citizens. And, and that if you pass it with a law, enforced by the coercive apparatus of the government, then it's it's extorted. So you're just you're taking the money. So he's, he said, oh, go, no, 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 it's not that. It's not that. All right. So back to the quote. It is not averred that this most desirable result can in all instances be obtained. But it is nevertheless the end to be aimed at. True statesmanship and true political economy, not less than true philosophy, present this perfect theory as the goal to be more and more closely approximated by our imperfect practice. The desire to achieve such a result cannot be regarded as an unreasonable ambition, for though all mankind were well-fed, well-clothed, well-housed, they might still be half-civilized. According to the European theory, men are divided into classes, some to toil and earn, others to seize and enjoy. According to the Massachusetts theory, all are to have an equal <laughs> Sorry, I, I just I can't I can't keep out the performance whenever they talk about equal. Uh I'm okay, man. All are to have an equal chance for earning, an equal security in the enjoyment of what they earn. Except, of course, that, that part that's taken through tax theft. The latter tends to equ equality of condition, the former to the grossest inequalities. Tried by any Christian standard of morals, or even by any of the better sort of heathen standards, can anyone hesitate for a moment in declaring which of the two will produce the greater amount of human welfare? and which, therefore, is the more conformable to the divine will. So you see, again, it says, so it's God's will that you pay taxes to support these public schools. The European theory is blind to what constitutes the highest glory as well as the highest duty of the state. Is that not the family? Not the highest duty of the family, but the state. Continue with the quote. Our ambition as a state, should trace itself to a different origin and propose to itself a different object. Its flame should be lighted at the skies. Its radiance and its warmth should reach the darkest and the coldest abodes of men. It should seek the solution of such problems as these. To what extent can competence displace pauperism? How nearly can we free ourselves from the low-minded and the vicious? 
not by their expatriation, but by their elevation. Third, to what extent can the resources and powers of nature be converted into human welfare, the peaceful arts of life be achieved, and the vast treasures of human talent and genius developed? How much of suffering in all its forms can be relieved? Or, what is better than relief, how much can be prevented? Cannot the classes of crimes be lessened and the number of criminals in each class be diminished? Now, two or three things will doubtless be admitted to be true, beyond all controversy, in regard to Massachusetts. By its industrial condition and its business operations, it is exposed far beyond any other state in the Union to the fatal extremes of overgrown wealth and desperate poverty. Its population is far more dense than that of any other state. Now remember, this is 1837 he's talking about. So. <clears throat> it is four or five times more dense than the average of all the other states taken together. And density of population has always been one of the proximate causes of social inequality. According to population and territorial extent, there is far more capital in Massachusetts, capital which is movable and instantaneously available, than in any other state in the Union. And probably both these qualifications respecting population and territory could be omitted without endangering the truth of the assertion. Now, surely, nothing but universal education can counteract this tendency to the domination of capital and the servility of labor. If one class possesses all the wealth and all the education, while the residue of society is ignorant and poor, it matters not by what name the relation between them may be called. The latter, in fact and in truth, will be the servile dependents and subjects of the former. But if education be equally... <laughs> uh, just, sorry. Okay. If education be equally diffused, it will draw property after it by the strongest of all attractions. For such a thing never did happen and never can, <laughs> and never can happen as that an intelligent and practical body of men should be permanently poor. Did you catch that? Such a thing never did happen. <laughs> never can happen. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, with all of us talk about education, this guy, this guy certainly didn't read history. Anyway, I'll continue with the quote. Property and labor in different classes are essentially antagonistic. But property and labor in the same class are essentially fraternal. The people of Massachusetts have, in some degree, appreciated the truth that the unexampled prosperity of the state, its comfort, its competence, its general intelligence and virtue, is attributable to the education, more or less perfect, which all its people have received. But are they sensible of a fact equally important? Namely, that it is to this same education that two-thirds of the people are indebted for not being today the vassals of as severe a tyranny in the form of capital as the lower classes of Europe are bound to in any form of brute force. Education, then, beyond all other devices of human origin, is a great equalizer of the conditions of men, the balance wheel of the social machinery. I do not here mean that it so elevates the moral nature 
as to make men disdain and abhor the oppression of their fellow men. This idea pertains to another of its attributes. But I mean that it gives each man the independence and the means by which he can resist the selfishness of other men. It does better than to disarm the poor of their hostility towards the rich. It prevents them being poor. Agrarianism is the revenge of poverty against wealth. The wanton destruction of the property of others, the burning of haystacks, of corn stacks, the demolition of machinery because it supersedes hand labor, the sprinkling of vitriol on rich dresses, is only agrarianism run mad. Education prevents both the revenge and the madness. On the other hand, a fellow feeling for one's class is the common instinct of hearts, not wholly sunk in selfish regard for a person. The spread of education by enlarging the cultivated class will open a wider area over which the social feeling will expand. And if this education should be universal and complete, it will do more than all things else to obliterate factious distinctions in society. For the creation of wealth, then, for the existence of a wealthy people and a wealthy nation, intelligence is the grand condition. The number of improvers will increase as the intellectual constituency, if I may so call it, increases. In former times, and in most of the world, even at the present day, not one man in a million has ever had such a development of mind as made it possible for him to become a contributor to art or science. Let this development proceed, and contributions of inestimable value will be sure to follow. That political economy, therefore, which busies itself about capital and labor, supply and demand, interest and rents, favorable and unfavorable balance of trade, but leaves out account of the elements of a widespread mental development, is naught but stupendous folly. The greatest of all the arts in political economy is to change a consumer into a producer. And the next greatest is to increase the producing power. And this to be directly obtained by increasing his intelligence. For mere delving, an ignorant man is but little better than a swine, whom he so much resembles in his appetites and surpasses in his power of mischief. Okay, some long term consequences. That's man in his own words. Horace Mann in his own words. Notice, completely absent from this, is how this education is to be funded. Though, of course, he knew that it could only come from taxation, including taxation of those who did not and never would have children. So then you go back to the, the, the philosophical question, is that a proper role of government? He said yes. Others went on. All right, now, at the time, what does education mean? At the time, in the 1830s, teaching in this country was a male-dominated profession. Generally, Protestant ministers would do it to supplement their income. So Protestant congregations, unlike Catholic parishes, they don't have daily mass or daily services. You know, they generally the minister would preach on Sundays. Uh, but then, and then to supplement his income, he, he would teach. And then some would, you know, they spent a lot of time preparing their sermons, long sermons. They'd have them uh, typed up in essay form and sold as pamphlets. That's one way. And then they'd attract attention so then they could get employment as a teacher, uh, you know, and, and so on. That's just, you know, how things were done. At the time, only Catholics routinely used female teachers. Of course, they were religious sisters. And herein, we find two unattributed imitations of Catholics by Horace Mann. 
First, he pioneered government-funded normal schools in the United States. So no, I know that doesn't sound right. Uh, but in this case, it's not normal as opposed to abnormal, but rather normal in the sense of norms. So a normal school was a teacher school, a school, for, a school to teach people to be teachers, where prospective educators were instructed in the norms of teaching children. And at the same time, you know, to get into a normal school, you only needed a high school diploma for admission. And the training was not as long as a university degree program. So it was a professional school. It was like training you to get a job as a teacher. Um, also, at the time, uh, women were not admitted to university. Uh, now, there were some, there were women's, you know, specifically women's colleges and that, you know, for the women of the elite. Uh, but in general, uh, the United States, the, you know, the, what we think of as universities, Yale, you know, uh, Harvard, originally those were divinity schools. Those were seminaries, you know, Protestant seminaries. So, of course, women were not allowed. So attending these normal schools were, for the most part, women. Uh, and so this led to man's initiative led to the feminization of the teaching profession in the United States. The first tax-funded normal school was opened in 1839 under man's auspices as Secretary of Education. It was the uh, in Lexington, Massachusetts, called the Lexington, Lexington Normal School. In 1853, it relocated to Framing, uh, Framingham. Uh, forming the nucleus of what still exists as Framingham State University. It's the oldest continuously operated public normal school in the United States. A lady named Anna Brackett attended Framingham and uh, trained to be a teacher, and later she became the first woman principal of a teacher's college outside of the Catholic system, of course, where it was nuns at this point still. Uh, were heavily involved in education. Now, as in all things with regard to education, the Catholic Church provided the precedent from which they all imitated, of course, without acknowledgement. The first normal school, in the sense of a school designed to teach teachers, was in Catholic France. In 1685, Saint Jean-Baptiste de La Salle, who was the founder of the Christian Brothers, established the first normal school, the École Normale, in Reims, France. <clears throat> now, Horace Mann encountered opposition to this public school movement. As not everybody, you know, agreed with this. Opposition from, first, some fellow Protestants who saw this as taking employment from ministers with expensive seminary educations from Harvard, Yale, Princeton, etc., and being teachers is one way that they would, you know, that they would pay that off. Second, opposition was from religiously non-aligned Americans who believed that parents were the proper educators of their children, not the government. Third, opponents were those who did not want money they earned taken by the government for anything at all, you know, including schools. Now, one way that man got around all this opposition and promoted the public education movement was uh, that it would provide both. One category would be moral instruction. As, and then a second category would be elementary education in reading, writing, arithmetic. Moral instruction. I remember early 19th century Protestants, it, it just it, it would be incomprehensible to them that moral instruction could come from any, any source other than the Bible, and this, specifically the King James Bible. Even Horace Mann could conceive of no proper education without the Bible. Yet, apart from that, he consistently asserted that these free, school, free, free schools would be non-sectarian, that they would not be religious. Now, by that, he didn't mean the same thing we, that is meant today. He meant that they would not 
be specifically Lutheran or Methodist or Anglican, and certainly not Catholic. But they would be, they would use the Bible. As, as he, he phrased it, the Bible is above any, any sectarian division. Like the Bible is above Lutheran, Methodist, Anglican, or any of those differences. So the Bible can be used by everyone. You know, so that, that was his logic. Now, of course, that's not, the, that's not the way this whole movement developed, but that was his, that was his thinking. Now, Catholic bishops of the time viewed the use of the King James Bible in public schools as a strategy to establish Protestantism as a de facto state religion. Because of state, because this is, this is funded by tax money. For that reason, it, it, otherwise it's inexplicable, but for that reason, Catholic bishops in the 19th century United States assumed a public posture of opposition to the entire public school movement. This created quotes to be used by the publicity machine to prove the universal Protestant assumption that the Catholic hierarchy wanted to keep people ignorant so that they would be more easily controlled. Why else, they asked, would churchmen oppose study of the Bible? Now, the reason I spent so much time, you're not going to believe what this develops into. I know, you're going to think I'm making it up, but I'm not. This is decades, decades, this is going Into the next century, this is going on. This is the origin of a series of conflicts in American religious history called the Bible Wars. Bible Wars. All right. We'll get to them in their chronology. Just like I'm not making it up. All right. Same year, 1837, <clears throat> July 28th. The Diocese of Dubuque, Iowa, was created to encompass uh, what is now the state of Iowa, uh, both Dakotas, and parts of Minnesota. Uh, Julien Dubuque, D-U-B-U-Q-U-E, was a French-Canadian Catholic. He negotiated a treaty with the Fua Indians and began mining lead in the territory in the 1790s. In 1883, an Italian Dominican named Father Samuel Mazzuccelli built a church in Dubuque under the patronage of St. Raphael, the archangel. At the time, the region was under the jurisdiction of the Diocese of St. Louis, Missouri, established in 1826. The Bishop of St. Louis was uh, another Italian immigrant priest, Joseph Rosati. He recommended, as the founding bishop of Dubuque, Matthias Loras, L-O-R-A-S, a French immigrant priest, Born in Lyon, France, 1792, Loris was ordained a priest for that diocese in 1815. He was one of the missionaries recruited for Mobile, Alabama, by Bishop Michael Portier in 1829. Portier ordained him bishop in Mobile on December 10, 1837, before he took the trip to Iowa. So this connects. We talked about Portier before and the, uh, uh, the carving of, of Mississippi and Alabama out of the Diocese of Louisiana and the two Floridas. So this connects Loras with, with that story. Loras discovered when he arrived at his new diocese one priest, three churches, one school to serve 2,000 Catholics. He traveled to France to recruit clergy, and he returned with two priests and four subdeacons. One of the priests was Joseph Cretin, who would later become the founding bishop of St. Paul, Minnesota, in 1850. Loras created an improvised seminary in his residence, which developed into Loras College and St. Pius X Seminary. The Sisters of Charity of the Blessed Virgin Mary relocated from Philadelphia to Iowa in 1843, opened a school for girls. Iowa was admitted as state number 29 on December 28, 1846. Three years later, 1849, Trappist monks opened an abbey 
at New Mellory, near Dubuque. One of its monks, Father Clement Smythe, S-M-Y-T-H-E, became coadjutor bishop to Loras in 1857 and succeeded Loras when he died on February 19, 1858. By the time Loras died, the diocese had grown to having 60 parishes, 40 missions, 54,000 Catholics, served by 48 priests. 1838, one year after the public education movement began in Massachusetts, well, I should say it began before that. So one year after it achieved its first success in Massachusetts, also one year after Loras became founding bishop of Dubuque. The Bishop of Philadelphia addressed some misunderstanding fomented by Protestant anti-Catholic writers. Francis Patrick Kenrick, K E N. R-I-C-K, lived from 1796 to 1863. At the time, this time in 1838, he was serving as coadjutor bishop of Philadelphia. Kenrick was responding to another outbreak of anti-Catholic bigotry, which was often accompanied by violence, anti-Catholic violence. The trigger for this wave was the publication of a book by an Episcopal bishop in Vermont named Henry Hopkins, focused on uniting all Protestant denominations by identification against Catholicism. The book was published in New York in 1835 under the title The Church of Rome in her primitive purity compared to the Church of Rome at the present day. Bishop Kenrick responded to critiques of Catholic enslavement to the Bishop of Rome with an argument that became standard in Catholic apologetics of the period. Uh, So this is a a quote uh, from a work an essay written by Bishop Kenrick titled The Primacy of the Apostolic See and the Authority of General Councils Vindicated. Okay, so this is an, uh, an, an exemplar quote. The key to the whole history of the Middle Ages appears to us to be the sentiment then prevailing that Christian principle should regulate all the departments of government and all the relations of life. We do not think that the authority of the popes over sovereigns is to be accounted for merely by reason of the relations in which they actually stood to them or to the concessions which had been made by former princes. On the contrary, We trace those concessions and relations to the persuasion, which was universal, that the head of the Christian church was the fittest arbiter of the respective obligations of princes and their subjects, and the natural judge of all, in what regarded the application of the Christian maxims to society. End quote. Now, this argument is certainly not false, but it is incomplete. Uh, This argument reveals the Americanism implicit in so much Anglo-Catholic Maryland ecclesiology. The argument defending the papacy that Bishop Kendrick put forward is purely in the natural, practical order, without reference to the supernatural protections enjoyed by the popes as successors of St. Peter. That is because Kenrick and the Americanist in general followed Bishop John Carroll and did not regard infallibility as attached to the office of the papacy, but rather as a charism of the census fidelium, the sense of the faithful. 
So we'll get to this later, and that's one of one of the reasons why Americanism would be condemned as a heresy by Leo the Thirteenth in eighteen ninety nine. Okay, so rewinding to the following year, 1839, October 24th. Upon the recommendation of Bishop Antoine Blanc of New Orleans, that's B-L-A-N-C, the provincial of the first Vincentian province in the United States, Father John Timon, T-I-M-O-N, was appointed first apostolic prefect of Texas. This position is the lowest level in the sense of the entry level of ecclesiastical organization given to a mission territory. An apostolic prefect is not an ordained bishop. He's an ordained priest, but has special faculties to perform the sacrament of confirmation, but not the sacrament of holy orders. Timon did uh, did make a personal reconnaissance of Texas, at least parts of it. I mean, it was too huge for him to visit you know, every square mile. Uh, but since he was provincial, uh, you know, he, he was not in a position to give it the kind of attention that only a resident priest could. Um, so he appointed as vice prefect a French-born Vincentian named Father Jean-Marie Odin, O-D-I-N, originally recruited by Bishop de Bourg, so we meet him again, for service in the Diocese of Louisiana and the two Floridas in 1823. And we will meet Odin again. Uh, three months later, December 3rd, 1839, Pope Gregory the Sixteenth condemned the, the the slave trade. I mean the, the commerce of Af- the enslavement of Africans and then and then transporting them across the Atlantic as slaves. The document is uh, in Supremo. And this is an exemplar quote. For the slave trade, although it has diminished in more than one district, is still practiced by numerous Christians. We warn and adjure earnestly in the Lord, faithful Christians of every condition, that no one in the future dare to vex anyone, despoil him of his possessions, reduce him to servitude, or lend aid and favor to those who give themselves up to these practices, or exercise that inhuman traffic by which the blacks, um, so that's the word he used, as if they were not men but rather animals, having been brought into servitude, in no matter what way, are without any distinction, in contempt of the rights of justice and humanity, bought, sold, and sometimes, and devoted sometimes to the hardest labor. Further, in the hope of gain, propositions of purchase being made to the first owners of the blacks, dissensions and almost perpetual conflicts are aroused in these regions. So he's referring there to his various um, slave brokers, you know, slave, slavers, um, would, 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 one of the ways they did, they harvested, you know, I mean, it, it was that they would uh, uh, take advantage of pre-existing tribal rivalries in Africa. <clears throat> and like they would suborn one tribe, so okay, we'll support you. And then you help us capture guys from your enemy tribe and we'll enslave them. And not only will we enslave them, but we'll take them, we'll take them out of Africa altogether. And it's most of the young, you know, young men, you know, the young people that they, young men and women that they would take. So that would weaken the enemy tribe. So that's what he's referring to here, dissensions and perpetual conflicts. So back to the quote. We reprove then, by virtue of our apostolic authority, all the practices above mentioned as absolutely unworthy of the Christian name. By the same authority, we prohibit and strictly forbid any ecclesiastic or lay person from presuming to defend as permissible this traffic in blacks under no matter what pretext or excuse, or from publishing or teaching in any manner whatsoever, in public or private, opinions contrary to what we have set forth in this apostolic letter. End quote. So, after 1839, 
Catholics in the United States did have some specific guidance insofar as they could not defend the slave trade as permissible, nor could they assist in reducing any person to a condition of slavery. Yet, Pope Gregory did not instruct Catholics to pursue the abolition of slavery itself as a moral imperative. Further diluting the teaching, we encounter again Bishop John England of Charleston. He explained away the Pope's decree in a letter to John Forsyth Sr., who was the Secretary of State of the the U.S. Secretary of State. Uh, So uh, uh, this letter on October 7th, 1840. This is a letter from Bishop England to Secretary John Forsyth. Here's an exemplar quote. Sir, I proceed to give additional reasons to show that the letter of our Holy Father, Gregory, the 16th of that name, regarded only the slave trade. It is against this desperate traffic, which Portugal and Spain have so enormous a share that the Pope's letters directed to against which the Pope's letters are directed and not against domestic slavery, of the existence of which he is conscious, but respecting which he uses no action, and which rests upon a totally different basis, as it is perfectly unconnected with cruelty, such as is above described. Okay, now that that's obviously a ridiculous statement, but that that's that's I'm letting these people speak on their own. So this is what a Catholic prelate wrote to one of the highest ranking officers of the nation to explain away the Pope's ruling. Now, oh, and you might ask why. So John Forsythe was the Secretary of State for Andrew Jackson, and Andrew Jackson was, of course, a slave owner. Yeah. All right, so back to the, uh, skipping down, back to the quote. Respecting domestic slavery, we distinguish it from the compulsory slavery of an invaded people. The situation of a slave under a humane master ensures to him food, raiment, and dwelling, together with a variety of small comforts. It relieves him of the apprehensions of neglect and sickness, from all solicitude for the support of his family, and in return, all that is required is fidelity and moderate, moderate labor. Remember earlier I read some accounts of what life was like. On the, so this, this guy's, anyway. Uh, I do not deny that slavery has its evils, but the above are no despicable benefits. Hence, I have known many freemen who have regretted their manumission. Slavery then, sir is regarded by the church of which the pope is the presiding officer not did you like that presiding officer you know, this one. not to be incompa- not to be incompatible with the natural law to be the result of sin by divine dispensation to have been established by human legislation and when the dominion of the slave is justly acquired but the master be lawful not only in the sight of the human tribunal, but also in the eye of heaven. But not so the slave trade, or the reducing into slavery the African and the Indian in the manner which Portugal and Spain sanctioned, which they continue in many instances still to perpetuate, and which this apostolic letter has justly censored as unlawful. Okay, explaining it away. So when we get to the Civil War, we'll see... I mean, everybody was, I mean, generally the church sided with their region. You know, bishops in the north generally sided with the Union. Bishops in the south generally sided with the Confederacy, though there were a couple of, you know, crossovers. But we'll get to that in due course. Okay, that was 1839, so that brings us to the end of the decade of the 1830s. So we'll stop there, pick up next with the 1840s, uh, and we'll see uh, Catholic missions into what became the state of Wyoming. So for now, thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.